Growing your own food is amazing, but imagine putting in all that hard work only to have disappointing harvests at the end of the season. Hi, I'm Ben, and if you want to get the most from your gardening, you'll want to avoid a few of the most common pitfalls that everybody makes at some point. Let's take a look at the top five and what to do about them. What are they? Well, you'll need to watch on to find out. Number one on our list of pitfalls is biting off more than you can chew. Every gardener wants to expand their growing area, but hang on a minute, there's a lot to be said for keeping things a bit smaller and manageable. All that enthusiasm can quickly run out of steam when the reality of weeding and watering sets in. Now, when I was 10, I started with a very small growing area, no bigger than about two of these beds here. In it, I grew some onions, some lettuce, and a few gudicia for a splash of colour. It wasn't much, but do you know what? I loved every single moment of it because I never felt overwhelmed. It was manageable. If you're new to gardening, consider starting small with a smaller area like that, or perhaps just a few pots. Then, as you master that and your confidence grows, expand your growing area. It's a good idea to start with easy vegetables that will give you a reliable harvest without too much fuss. And for me, there are a few standout veggies in this regard. Beans, especially climbing or pole beans, potatoes, garlic and onions, salad leaves of all kinds, chard and squash family plants, especially the ever obliging zucchini or courgette. Our garden planner has the option to filter the plant selection to only those plants that are easy to grow. Master these no-fuss crops, feel great about growing them, and then branch out and expand your horticultural horizons. Such is the desire to grow that even more experienced gardeners cram in more than they probably should from time to time. Now, I think the main reason for this is to do with how many seeds you get in a packet. Take these uh, broccoli seeds, for example. There are 500 in this packet. Imagine trying to sow all of those before the sow-by date. You probably only need 15 to 20 a year. So it's tempting to sow them and then grow them all on because you hate to see waste, don't you? But that's a false economy. The seedlings may look really good and strong and healthy to start with, but they will soon compete with each other for resources, growing weak and tall and thin and giving a very disappointing harvest, if a decent harvest at all. So it's good to be cruel to be kind. Only select the very strongest seedlings and grow those on and discard the rest. And all those spare seeds? Well, save what you can till next year or just give them away to your gardening friends. In my own garden, I make sure I know exactly how many plants I will need before sowing. And for that, I use the garden planner, which automatically calculates exactly how many plants you need when you draw out a row or a block. The coloured area around the plants here shows exactly the amount of root space that will be needed, so you can make sure the plants are properly spaced. Gardens aren't detached from nature. They're very much part and parcel of the local ecosystem. So that means that aphids and whitefly pests like that, you're going to see them on your crops from time to time. So don't be disheartened when you see them. Expect the occasional attack, but fight back using the power of nature. A little forward planning can ensure Mother Nature's on your side. One way to achieve this is to mix in several different companion planting flowers to attract beneficial bugs such as hoverflies, which will keep pests in check by eating them. If pests strike early in your area, say from early to mid-spring, be sure to include some early flowering companions and leave a few crop plants like onions, garlic and carrot in the ground over winter so they can flower in their second season. They'll provide a superb source of nectar to attract natural pest predators while looking downright stunning in the process. I covered some of the very best companion planting flowers to include in the vegetable garden in a recent video, so I will pop a link to that down below. Many studies have shown that mixing up crop families can help to confuse flying insect pests. But for some crops, further measures are necessary. Take for example brassicas, that's crops in the cabbage family like uh, kale, broccoli and of course cabbage. They're an absolute magnet for caterpillars, which can decimate them within a matter of days. To prevent this, grow these crops together in one area, then use netting or other protection to keep the butterflies responsible for those caterpillars off. 
In a similar way, carrots are often covered with fine mesh netting or fleece to prevent carrot fly. The old phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket, is sound advice for gardeners too. Imagine planting out all of your tender seedlings only to have them killed off by a late frost, or for example your newly transplanted seedlings being mown to the ground by a frenzy bird or slug attack. Not a nice idea. So avoid this heartbreak by sowing in smaller batches, say every two to three weeks. As well as having some spare seedlings in the event of a sudden problem, you can also this way spread out your harvests to avoid a sudden glut. On my plant list I can see the window of time in which I can make these multiple sowings and if you choose to use the garden planner you can have email reminders sent to you every two weeks to prompt you to sow some more. Just like us, plants need nutrients to grow strong and healthy. They need something to eat as well as drink. Planting your crops and hoping for the best is really not a strategy. And furthermore, the more you take from the soil in the form of harvests without giving back, the quicker your soil will become impoverished. The solution is to feed your soil and by extension, the plants growing in it. You can use any organic matter for this, compost or well-rotted manure, for example, and you don't need to dig it in. You can just spread it an inch or so, say two to five centimeters deep around your actively growing crops. And that will help to also suppress weeds. What this does is nourish the microbial life in your soil, which helps plant roots to access all the nutrition they need. Applying organic matter like this also helps to improve your soil structure, breaking down hard or sticky clay soils into a finer, crumblier consistency, while helping very free-draining sandy soils to hold on to valuable moisture a little longer. Don't forget plants in pots either. They rely entirely on you for all of their nutritional needs. And once all of the nutrients have been used up in their container, you'll need to apply a liquid feed, such as a tomato feed or a comfrey feed, for example. Avoid these pitfalls and you'll have a garden to be proud of. Now, if you're new to gardening, I'd like to know what you're most excited about. For me, it was always, and still is, seeing those seedlings poke through. It's just so exciting but I'd like to know what's made you decide to get your hands dirty. Let me know in the comments below. And if you're a seasoned gardener, then why not share your top tips in the comments too? Next episode, we're going to be giving my vegetable garden a bit of a spruce up and looking at some areas that need beautifying and screening too. If that sounds like it might be useful to you, please be sure to tune in. I'm really excited to share my plans with you. Now, before you go, please do subscribe and ding the notification bell so you're notified of every video that we upload. I'll catch you next time.